is the spot. Um, I think we're ready to go. What do you reckon? Yeah. Yeah, Go for it. Well, hey, Wayne, how far into my story was I on that pre-roll? Uh, about five minutes. Five minutes. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Didn't say anything. Jeez, we, we, we better get started on this podcast. All right. All right, man, and we'll hit it, okay? And welcome to The Pager Train. Today I'm in the studio with me, uh, author uh, Jesse Highland. Welcome to the show. Thanks. Thanks for uh, thanks for having me. Yeah, man, not, not a problem. Um, we'll I'll cut straight to the chase. You've uh, just recently released recently released a book. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's kind of a bit weird. It came out on uh, Amazon Kindle first mm-hmm. at the start of this month, mm-hmm. and then it's just slowly appeared on all the uh, book websites like Vimix and Book Depository and Amazon. You know, all the other, all the other ones. Everywhere so, you can find books, basically. Pretty much, yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. Okay. Um. What's uh? Why, uh, why a book? Why have you decided? Is this your first book that you've written? Yeah, or? this is the first book I've written. Um, Nerve wracking. Not the first <laughs> thing I've written. Um. I've written scripts, but um. Yeah, this is the very first book I've written. I've always been, you know, into writing ever since I was a young kid. You mm-hmm. know, I was always writing stories and um just whatever. You know, um, just little short novels and stuff like that and mm. when i was at school i used to read them out to class and stuff and then when i got older i was doing more like poetry and uh i was doing comic books making comic books and you know picture fun, books yeah. and and then uh i started this one when i was 19 about a year after i finished school i just started yeah. um at uws yep and uh WSU, UWS, well, WSU. W- WSU now was UWS when I was there. But... <laughs> it was it was that uh, <laughs> it was uh, UWS when I was there as well. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and yeah, I was just like you know I've got spare time and you know I've always wanted to write a novel ever since I was a kid and I was like let's get to it and then you know cut to about what what is it seven or eight years now later on it's finally yeah. done, <laughs> but there was about two or three years where I didn't. I didn't do anything with it, you know, so... Yeah, you, you sometimes get into those stalling moments in yeah. life, uh, especially with your creative work. Um, I usually find, um, usually you're having a bit of an identity crisis at that time, um, you know, uh, especially being a writer. You, mm. you might be question, am I a writer? Like some writers I've talked to, they would say, if you're not writing every day, you're not a writer. Mm. I'm like, oh, well, I don't know about that. I've got to be in the mood. I yeah. can't do it every day. Um, but other writers will say, well, you've got to force that mood. you yeah. got to make that happen. Uh, and I've experienced both. Um, I certainly, when I'm, because um, I write music and I write um, scripts, mm. uh, when I do that, um, it's certainly a more enjoyable um, uh, activity when you're inspired. But there's sometimes on where I'm forced to write, where I have to do it for work. Yeah. Uh, like writing scripts for work or yeah. uh, doing voiceover work. Yeah. Um, and yeah, when it's forced, um, you still can do it. Mm. It's still doable. Mm. Um, but yeah, that inspiration side of things. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. That's a, that's a hard one. Um, I, I don't know. I'm a, I'm a planner. I plan out my writing. Like some people are a blinking cursor sort of person. Yeah. So they'll just look at the blinking cursor. Which, which are you? How do you approach your writing um, uh, style? It really depends. I mean, cause I work in journalism, so mm. I'm writing almost every day, um, you know, writing stories and scripts and whatnot. Mm-hmm. Um, so for that, it's obviously forced, but it's it's just factual news stories but if it's mm. something creative mm. i've really got to be in the mood to do it and some you know sometimes you just can't be asked to be yeah well i think um but as well like you're probably going to work because you're not writing full time yeah um you've got to find time to write and it's on extra time mm. like if you had the whole day to do it it'd be a different, different oh yeah beast. oh yeah definitely um yeah. uh because my wife she's a writer and uh she 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 acclaims to um, well, not a claims, but she um, recommends uh, to write in the morning, like get up and start writing, because mm. um, then, then your brain will get into that habit and be into that space all the time when you wake up. Yeah, train it and stuff like that. But yeah, I usually get up at <laughs> for, for work. I usually get up at three thirty. So three yeah. thirty. Yeah. Jesus. So wow, I don't miss doing that sort of stuff. Well, I'm I'm changing jobs now, so I'm now starting at you know uh, nine a.m. instead mm. of. Uh, 4 30 a.m so <laughs> what are you doing are you, so, so it sounds like you're in the news business are you doing yes. uh, tv news or radio news so or? i was at sky news mm. and i'm about to start at the daily mail okay um yeah so that's a bit of a conversion yeah a bit yeah. of a conversion a yeah. uh, bit different so um yeah so it's just been my because you know i studied journalism and media arts at mm-hmm. wsu <laughs> and uh <laughs> and uh and yes, yeah, so I just I've just sort of been in and out of like you know communication media type jobs, and then well, I was at, I was at the Wiggles for a bit, 
Oh yeah. What do you mean at the Wiggles? Like uh, they have like <laughs> like the Wiggles Corp. No, no, no. So this 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 was actually doing a post production job. Oh okay. So this is really weird. I had a friend who I played football with who worked for the Wiggles, and he'd been there for like ten years. Mm. And I was sort of going in and out of different writing and marketing jobs. Mm. And he's like, "Oh, you've you know done film and stuff like that before. Do you want to come do some post production for the Wiggles?" I was like, "Sure." Yeah, so okay. I did that for a bit, and then I went to. Sky News, and now I'm going to the Daily Mail. So I've just kind of tri- 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 just gone around all the communication. Yeah, just traversing around <laughs> yeah. the place. I've done a bit of that. Um, I certainly have. I um, from studio management to um, TV production. Yeah, uh, making commercials. But now I tend to do it more uh, for my business. I do it more for myself because um, I have my day job, which is pretty exciting. Sometimes uh, it's everything from plumbing to IT and studio management. But uh, when you finish that, you then got to go and work, like because like if you're working on a book, it's like running a business. You've got to you've got to constantly apply yourself to it. Otherwise, it doesn't get anywhere. You have to get somewhere with it. Mm. So yeah, seven years. That's a that's a that's a lot of weekends. A yeah. lot of weekends, a lot of night times. Yeah, yeah. Um. So what? So the book's abandoned. That's the yeah. name. It's, that's the name and the title of the book. What's yeah. what's what's the what's abandoned about? So it's about a young guy who's um, sort of grown up in and around this sort of big outback town, mm-hmm. um, and he's sort of grown up in a you know sort of sketchy lifestyle. Um, he's sort of gotten mixed in with the wrong sort of crowds, and then mm-hmm. he's sort of gone into a bit of trouble here and there with Sounds crime familiar. and what <laughs> whatnot. And um, basically, um, this group he's with. Um, he, he's trying to get them a, a dealer for a drug deal. Mm-hmm. The drug deal goes horribly wrong. And then they decide to leave him in the middle of nowhere. Mm. Um, while they're trying to, well, I can't. Don't give, no, don't give yeah. too much away. Basically he's just left in the outback to yeah, yeah. fend for himself. So he's much. got, he's got a challenge uh, ahead of him and he finds himself in an unfortunate situation. Pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, abandoned. All right. Well, they've got it right here. There you go, guys. <laughs> Actually, can you pull that up on uh, um, on our channel there? I'm sure we got it up on Amazon, ready to go. Oh, the Hazy Train. Yeah, just do a bit of do a bit of pro. Oh, there's man. There, there we go. There we go. Uh, yeah, you're up on Amazon there. Yeah, it's on all the book sites. If you if you go to the book sites and search for them specifically, they're all it's all pretty much most of them. So, man, that must be a trip. Like going through seven years of writing, mm. getting it edited. Mm. Um, having it scrutinised. Yep. Um, then um, sampling it out to friends, going, "What do you think of this?" Yep. To um, going to a printer and getting a because you'd, you'd need a um, a publisher, right? Yeah. So I basically, <coughs> I think I was um, when did I finish? I finished it. I finished the first draft. I think twenty eighteen. So that was about f- I think five years or whatever that mm-hmm. amounts to. And then I think for about a whole year while I was working full time, I just spend whatever spare time I could just editing, 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 and I'm just just changing so much stuff around. Mm. And then um and then I spent like I probably another year just editing and just going sending it to publishers, just constantly, just sending it to constant like can't even tell you how many publishers I send it to. Even overseas in the States, mm. the UK. And the thing is like um, you know, a lot of Authors have an agent, and I don't have an agent when it mm-hmm. comes to book writing. Not yet. Um, don't have so, one yet. <laughs> <laughs> not yet. Um, my cousin uh, has also published a book, a fiction book as well, and mm-hmm. she went through an agent and did it all, you know. And I was just constantly sending it out. And then um, I had two publishers who were interested, and then I went with this mm-hmm. mob here, and um, and then I spent like probably another year just hashing out with editors and typesetters and more editors and and just getting up to a certain point um where the publisher was like yep we like where it's at now because sometimes you got to with publishers you got to sort of you know even with film like studios you got to mm. sort of niggle a bit until they've like fine with putting it under their name and yeah but when they were like a tribute to it yeah yeah so and then yeah it's just um finally it's come out and um and just, i remember I, I actually um one of my best mates um bought it the other week and he was one of the ones i uh, send it to to read like think it is you know to get his opinion like oh, you know what do you think of this or whatever mm-hmm. and he, he, I remember I was walking with him and he's like this is so weird just having your book right here after mm-hmm. I read one of the first drafts of it he's yeah. like just a bit surreal just 
having it right here. So oh, it's pretty cool, dude. Well, a total congratulations! Like Thank getting you. getting a book out is that's an amazing feat. Um, but yeah, to see it out there in, in like endemics and stuff like that. Uh, well, it's not like it's, it's not specifically in the bookstores. Oh, yeah. Um, it's mostly um you'd buy the paperback or the mm-hmm. digital online. Um, oh, yeah. don't worry, you'll get it in there, man. Yeah. You'll get it in there. Get those, get those sales up. Well, I'm trying to get it. There's a couple of bookstores I am trying to get it into mm-hmm. at the moment. Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah, but it's, it's just a bit hectic because I'm you know, working full time and then I've also got all the press and marketing I'm trying to do for it and then the publisher's trying to do for it as well. Mm. So. Yeah, there's a lot of work that you wouldn't even think that goes into something like that. There's not just writing the book. Mm. There's, there's a lot that's bolted on around that, yeah? Um, like, uh, let me ask you a question that I've always been curious about. How does one select a font for their book? So the publisher does the font. Okay, I, they, 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 that's their branding? Yeah, so I think, I don't know what I wrote. I think I wrote in Times New Roman or something like that. I can't mm. remember what I wrote it in. And then they, the typesetter puts it in the font that the publisher you know, wants it as. So, yeah, okay. Yeah, I have no say in that. So. Yeah, you don't get a say in that? No. Oh, so the publisher picks it. <laughs> yeah. so I've always wondered that. Because like, when you look at the fonts, they're usually the same font. I wonder, I wonder if there's actually a standard for books. I, yeah, I could be wrong. They might use the same fonts for... Yeah, they might because they probably do research into fonts, right? To yeah. make sure that, well, this is easily read. Mm. It's easy on the eyes. Mm. Um, you can read it at a decent speed and not, not thumble with it. Because um, some fonts can be a bit angular, mm. I find. I'm a Myriad Pro person myself. Um, if you were a font, what font would you be? Um, man, that's an interesting question. Mm. Yeah, I'd, I'd definitely be married pro myself. That's a. <laughs> I like how you just choose that just straight away, just yeah. like no hesitation. Yeah, I've thought about um, it. Though. I've thought about it. Though. You thought about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Uh, it's going to sound generic, but maybe Times New Rome because that's more one Times New Rome with the ser- what do you call them? Serifs? The, the serifs uh, that are on the end of uh, Times New Roman. You know, the, you know the possibly. you know what I'm talking about. I know what you're talking about. I can't yeah. remember. I think they're called serifs. So you're a serif guy. So Muri Pro is serifless. I'm pretty sure. Oh, okay. It's all smooth. Yeah. You like the bang, bang, bold <laughs> sort of stuff. Oh, yeah, that's what I prefer. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. If you could be italics or bold or just normal, which would you be? I don't know if I could be italics. I think I'm bold. Yeah, I think I'm bold too. Yeah, you're bold? Yeah. You're a, you're a bold Times New yeah. Roman <laughs> and I'm bold Muri Pro. All right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's probably some psychologists getting, out there getting, that can analyze getting us. into the uh, <laughs> the the optics of uh, <laughs> text font on computers. Yeah, that's it. But um, you don't know. Um, look, I, I know that um, uh, when I write scripts, they're in a specific font because uh, I use software uh, to to write. Hmm. So I use Scrivener. Scrivener is my um, writing um, software that I use. Are you just using uh, Microsoft Word or? For my book, yeah, I just use Microsoft Word. But for my scripts, I've got a program mm-hmm. that I use that a f- good friend of mine sent to me. Mm-hmm. Um, I can't remember what it's called. I think it's called like Script Writer or does it look like some, a does it look like a little yin and yang? No, it's that's, the, that's the, the, the main one. page has like pictures of like film productions. Oh, okay, whatever. and that's what I use to write scripts, and it's really good. Yeah, because you know, like I'm a bit like with scripts, like the format is annoying. Yeah, and I sometimes you know scene act I just something like I don't always get everything correct so it sometimes just helps me to I never get it correct I don't know yeah. anyone who gets it correct I suppose copywriters get it correct because that's their job but yeah. like I don't ever get that format correct that's why I need software like because then I, 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 I've got hotkeys with it so I'll do like um, I'll do shift down and then it'll select are you doing an action scene character mm. and then um, it will start to remember your characters so if you hit like the letter C if you've got someone named Chris it will go oh you're talking Chris is talking now. Yeah. And then yeah. you go into the dialogue. It's very, for me, it's very smooth, very easy operation. Because mm. like, when you have to worry about formatting while writing, uh, it kind of kills the moment. Mm. Kills the moment. So then you've got to go, well, I'll write it in Word, and then I've got to go and reformat the bloody thing. Yeah. And that's a, and that's a tedious task in itself. So yeah, I'll mm. just do it as I go. The software does it for me. But I know that um, scripts have a specific font. And I can never remember it, but there is a specific font for scripts. Yeah, you know, I, can't, I can't remember it either. Yeah, but you'll always see a script. They yeah, always have the yeah, same yeah. font. Yeah. So I mean, that's why I'm curious. Is it the same? Actually, could you ask the... Let's ask the internet, Mr. Wade. Your favorite thing in the whole world, doing internet searches. Um, can we uh, look up... Uh, is there a um, is there a font used specifically? I want to guess it's not, but I could be wrong. Is there a font specifically for um, books? Oh, for books, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I want to know. Here we go. Um, serif. 
Seraphons are um, readable, so it's a ser. So I was close. I was close with that. So yeah. So yeah. You're. And I was the other way around though. So it's a non-serif, I think. Mm. Um, and therefore, uh, a bold of the book, uh, serif, uh, decorative stroke and finishes to the letter. Um, think Times New Roman fonts. Uh, uh, serif are easier to read on the reader's eyes. Mm. But yeah, okay. But that one doesn't have. Let me have a look at your one. Yeah, I can, it I can, does I can. have serifs. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, interesting. Okay. Um. So yeah, it looks like it may be specific to each publisher. They just have their. Yeah, yeah. They got their own one. They. They got their own font. They do. Yeah, yeah. How interesting, though. I find that stuff fascinating. Mm. How how does one go about selecting that and going, well, that's our brand and this fits in with uh, how we think and how we and what our belief structures are. Mm. And you go, but it's just a font, man. Do you think they do tests on what's... They would, though, right? To read for people, <laughs> just get all these tests, test yeah. guinea pigs in and just, okay, you all read these different yeah. fonts and... <laughs> You've got to go with the clipboard, <laughs> clipboard it in a timer and read it. The quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. Yeah. Okay, that was six seconds. We've got that? Yeah. Six seconds? All right, next font. <laughs> yeah, but people might read at different speeds though. So they do. I look. I, but my my reading has changed through my life. When I was yeah. uh, when in high school, I was a very slow reader. Um, I'm more I'm more of a visual learner. Mm. You know, um, reading uh, reading and learning um, took some time. It's when I had a lot of spare time when I um, started to read more. Then my brain became more attuned to reading. Mm. Um, and when I went to university, it changed all over again. Like I think I really learned three styles of reading. Mm. You know, you got your skim read. And then, and then you've got your sort of more of a firm read, and then you've got your critical read, like mm. you know every letter, every space where you're reading it. Um, and the more I do critical reads, the faster my skim reads get, mm. if that makes sense. Mm. Um, and now I do a lot of auto cue stuff, um, and that's a whole different ball game because now you're reading out aloud. Um, and yeah, my brain, my mouth works too fast for my brain, if that makes yeah. sense. Yeah. So I have to slow myself down to do auto cue. Um, and especially doing stuff like this, you know, you've got to, you've got to calm down, slow down, slow your brain down. Make it relaxed. Make it relaxed. Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, I just, yeah, I find that stuff fascinating how we pick these things. Mm. Uh, cause I look at it as well. Like, cause when I was thinking about this interview today, I was thinking, you know, uh, authorship. And then you think, well, uh, I look at it from a, a filmmaker kind of way, you know, it's, it's still storytelling, right? So mm. writing a book is telling a story, mm. writing a script is telling a story, making a movie is telling a story. And, um, you know, it, looking at your origin story, you know, you're talking about writing in high school mm. Mm. and this is where you became a writer. Mm. It's where you honed your craft and then going to university and studying that, mm. becoming a journalist, uh, when writing every day. Yeah. Like you, I imagine you're a touch typer, right? What do you mean? Like, just... don't, you can't, don't have to look at a keyboard to write. Oh, yeah, pretty close. Yeah, pretty close? I could, I could, yeah. Probably, there'd probably be like the odd, if I was, wasn't was looking at the keyboard and I was just typing, probably mm. be the odd letter or two I wouldn't get there, but I'd be, I'd be pretty close. Now, I've only just figured out though, because on a keyboard, because um, whenever I started writing more scripts, I realised, oh, I'm starting to look away from this thing. I'm not actually looking at it anymore. Yeah. And that only happened in the last few years. Hmm. Um, but a lot of journalists do that. Like, they would just won't even look at the keyboard. They'll yeah. just type furiously. Oh, Misty's like that. She will actually mm. turn to you and type and talk. Yeah. You know, what do you say? You want to say this? Okay. It's a bit scary. It's insane. <laughs> like, what are you doing? Get your hands on the wheel, man. <laughs> We're driving here. Yeah. <laughs> like, no, it's just the computer. I'll calm down. Um, but <laughs> yeah, no, the, there's, uh, on the keyboard, there is um, two little markers. I never really knew this, but there's two markers. I think it's on the J and I can't remember what the other letter is, but the two letters that are right dead smack in the middle of each other that... And, and 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 the five as well. The five has a little marker on it, so you mm. can go. Oh, I know where you know where you are on the keyboard without looking at it. Mm. It's like a it, it finds center. You find center with that. Yeah. And I found myself feeling for those. I'm like, oh, my brain did something without me telling it to do it. It just started doing it. Mm. Um, and that, it goes into that ergonomic design of a keyboard. Mm. Um, and it, it get even weirder, man. Let me blow, can I blow your mind? Can, let me sure. blow your mind. Blow my mind. Okay, so keyboard setups, because you know how like the top left starts with Q. Yeah. And you'd think, well, building a keyboard, why wouldn't you just make it alphabetical? Like, why don't you go A, B, C, D, or set it up with the vowels and the consonants? probably some weird psychological thing. No, I man, it's to do with um, typewriters. Because when the typewriter, the typewriter, you'd have the fan of letters, and they would come up and hit the paper. Yeah? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But some of them couldn't show up at the same, like, as one's returning, they get locked up. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So they figured out that they had to have this layout so that when keys were used at different frequencies that they wouldn't get key lock. 
Oh, okay. That's where that's why they're that numbered, and that innovative design to um, get around uh, um, locking up on ki- uh, on typewriters followed across to computers, and then ha- computers obviously don't have that problem. No. But yeah. because we had people that were typing for so long, they go, well, we need to transition that skill from a typewriter to a computer. So they took that coding system with them. Wow. Yeah, I find that stuff fascinating. I, d- I didn't even know that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, even to die until recently. I find that stuff fascinating. Like, why, why have these keyboard designs? Because there's different keyboard designs around the world. Mm. Uh, Russians, uh, the Russians do it differently. But um, if you look in um, uh, Western, Western cultures, we all do it the same way. Mm. And I think there's a name for it. Can we look that up, Mr. Wade? What, 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 what do you call? Uh, what is the name of a keyboard layout? <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, my arm's breaking off again. What is the name of a keyboard layout? Let's have a look at that. Because there's actually names of keyboard setups. And I started looking at this because I was looking at... Um, I a massive fan of hotkeys. Yeah. You, I'm sorry, guys, that have heard this story before me, like in hotkeys. <laughs> there it is. Uh, Querity. Oh, yeah. Yeah. All right. And yeah, there's a is designed um, a Latin scripts and alphabets. Uh, comes from the order of keys and the letters on the keyboard. Yeah, yeah, um, that's that's who created it. So it was created by the Shoals and uh, Glibland uh, typewriter and um, and Sons. So that's what the, yeah. But the, what I understand is because they had different letters that were coming up and hitting the paper, and they'd run into each other. So they had mm. to figure out what or, what order to put the keyboard in. So that you didn't get... Which is insane. That's pretty crazy. It's insane, isn't it? Yeah. But the, the thing is that that technology is carried over from 1873 to, to now. now. Yeah. And everyone just accepts it. Everyone's touched typing on this thing that was invented in 1873. Mm. And through 1873 to now, how many communication developments have there been? Mm. So... But that one, that one's just remained consistent. That one has remained. Yep. Yeah. I find that stuff absolutely fascinating. Um, but we look at it. Diff- we have different interfacing systems because that's essentially what that is. It's an interface. Um, you know, words themselves as an interface. Mm. Um, that's starting to change now. Mm. Uh, when you look at um, Neuralink and stuff like this, where um, even on a on a, t- a keyboard, we st- we would use a remember the old Nokia phones. Yeah, and you'd have to push five, ho- however many times to get the letter Q or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Um, we still adapted. Uh, the, see, that was adapted. Because of the limit of numbers on a on a phone, all right. But that's we got rid of that as soon as we could. We got rid of it because it's freaking annoying. Yeah, yeah. We're like, nah, don't want. If that. it's not if it's not broke, yeah, why well, fix it? it? Yeah. Um, but now we, we can't retrain human brains to go. Well, we're going to rearrange the keyboard mm. because because people will be like, no, you can't mm. do that. Yeah, we've been writing for my whole life. Mm. You can't change that now. Mm. Um, but I wonder. I wonder if one day we do. If we start looking at interfacing um, evolution. Because, uh, as I said, it's starting to happen if you go to Neuralink, where they're, they're thinking about where you can think words and they can be typed on a screen. Like the interface is changing. Mm. It'll probably change in our lifetime. Um, because from 1873, that format didn't change for a lot of people's lifetime. The whole life, that, that's how you write. Mm. You know, that's how you look at it. Mm. Um, but um, what about with your book? When you were pl- um, did you just write it from start to end? Or did you sort of write different chapters and then sort of piece it together? So... Uh, I I I find there was there's two types of writers, which is what I was the whole I've always heard. There's there's writers that have it all locked in their head, and there's writers that you know just plan and map it all out. Mm-hmm. I'm the type of person that has, just has it all locked in their head mm-hmm. mentally. So I don't I don't think I did many notes for this book before I wrote it. I just sort of just started writing, and I think I just kept writing because I started it when I was 19. I kept writing, <clears throat> and then. I, was, I think there were probably about a year I was writing and then I stopped about, I think, 150 pages in, give or take mm-hmm. a bit. And then I just left it for like two years or two or three years. Yeah. And then I was like thinking, oh, should I finish this? Should I not? You know, I was just deliberating that in my head and then mm. I thought, oh, no, stuff, I'll just finish. And then I just I just kind of just do a couple pages at a time or a chapter at a time or something like that until I got the first draft done. So Yeah, I think, because um, I'm, a, I'm a mapper outer. I like because the way you're talking about it is I think it's a, like a blinking cursor. You'll sit in front of a blinking cursor and go, "Okay, that's right. Mm. I've got the story. It's going to flow out of my hands. I'm going to get this done." Mm. Yeah, I'm a I, I'm a map it out person. I like I plan the the start, the middle, and what I think may be the end. I don't always go concrete on an end. Mm. When I do a story, I don't like to go. This is how it's going to end. Mm. Like the ending is always fluid in my mind, and it changes every time I write. Mm. 
Because I go, oh, I've got an idea what the ending's going to be. And every time I get through Act 1, Act 2, and I'm on to Act 3, I'm like, I don't yeah. like that ending anymore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't make sense with these characters. Well, actually, I changed the... Um, I had a few... Well, I didn't write it out, but I had a few different endings in mind, and I couldn't really decide which one I wanted to go with. And then the current ending it's got is um, eventually what I, what I came to. But I went through... When I was originally thinking about the whole plot of the book in my head, mm. I had a couple of different endings before. Not too different, but just a bit different. Mm. Um, and eventually I got one. But yeah... I, I, doing an ending because it, it can really make or break a story totally so it totally either makes it or breaks it mm. um, and thinking of an ending before you've got the story is literally impossible because I, I reckon you might you, you might think that you've done it but when you get there you go it doesn't fit or there's mm. always something wrong with it it has to evolve mm. so I always leave an ending to be fluid and allow it to change even when I've decided on an ending I still in the back of my mind go I can undo that decision yeah I can undo that and change my mind. Yeah. That's how fluid I find an ending. Um, but yeah, I map it out and then I um, I basically get to a point where I have to populate it with speech. I, I'm making... Oh, I've already got a character list. I've got the list of rooms that they're in and interact with. Um, I've got the reason they're there. I've got their obstacle that they're climbing. I've got the... So very detailed. <laughs> very yeah. detailed. I, I use palm cards. Oh, so okay, I write yeah. it all out in palm cards and I map it up on the wall. Yep. I know a few people that do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love, I love it though. Cause then I can see it. I can see it and then I can like look at it. I can zoom out and look at the whole story or then I can zoom in and look at, look at a scene. Mm. And, um, yeah, I've got a, I've got a few like, st you know, when I've got my stories out cause you'll see a whole bunch of like bricks of palm cards with rubber bands around them mm. that are different colors of different pens. Cause I've got this coding system where different pens and different, Coloured palm cards mean different things. Mm. Um, so I use the the uh, the yellow ones for the, like the the scene bullet points, mm. and the blue ones are used for plots and characters. Mm. Wow. Mm. I mean, I think um, my uh, <coughs> good mate Daryl, mm -hmm. kid Bond, that you've had on here. Yeah, I've had Daryl on here. He's, he's a really really cool dude. Yeah, he's a lovely dude. Big shout out, Daryl. Love you, mate. Um, he he does a lot of palm cards, mm. and he just completely just very specific you know complete just deconstructs all of his scripts all of his stories and just you know it's just and for me like someone who's just usually just has it all locked in their head mm. and that's how i like to write it's just it's just kind of even a little bit strange just seeing that just how deconstructed and just you know thoroughly thoroughly analyze just each mm. scene is and you know how in depth he goes with it so yeah i, lo I love that side of it I, that's the, that's part of the juice for me because when i get to the keyboard then it just flows once i have that map mm. it just flows out of me it's like it's like a tap's been opened up because when i get that to that point i've got the architecture mm. when i have the architecture and i know that it works i know that the relationship between characters works i know that the locations will work because mm. there's so many things that can throw off your arc because like, as you're running through the arc you go oh, i've made this person do this and now that's going to contradict what this person's going to say yeah and and when you end up with those quandaries it can turn you off writing you go this is too fucking hard yeah. man yeah yeah <laughs> yeah it's... um yeah it's challenging yeah uh, but doing a book, so that's like 110,000 words, 120,000. Yeah, so this one, uh, my books, I think it was, um, it's about 85, 90,000 words. 90,000, yeah. Somewhere around that that range, which is a pretty, you know, like I think it's like 75 to 95,000. It's a pretty normal, yeah, it's a normal length size, yeah. for a novel, so... Yeah, for a novel it is. I, I think it's it's again a format, so because there's all kinds of people that are authors that print books. Yeah. Um. I think the the the, the strangest ones I've come across are the self help people. Yeah. Um. They usually write a book and it's always a hundred pages and it's always in a big font. Mm. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They, they really pad it out, right? Yeah. Because when they're doing the talk. They go, and by the way, don't forget to buy the book and the, you'll see that in the foyer as you're exiting the, uh, yeah. you know, this talk. Yeah. And then they use, and then they use the book as credit to then sell their campaign to do their self-help mm. speech talks, right? And when I look at their books, I always go, it's a really big font, dude. <laughs> <laughs> I could read this in 20 minutes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> For a 100 page book, I can read yeah, it in 20 they got, minutes. They really got used out of those pages, so. Yeah, yeah. But it's got to look it's, it's all about <laughs> optics, you know. It's got to it's got to look thick, it's got to feel the weight, and yeah. it's got to be something that someone when they hold onto it they go, I just bought a book. Yeah. You got to walk away with that. Cuz if it's a pamphlet, you're like, 
Are you kidding? Yeah. <laughs> you could, but when you look at it, you go, mm. you probably could have fit that into a, a, an extended pamphlet. Mm. Um, but, uh, you know, you've got to be, you've got to write a book. But no, this is actually a book. Yeah. Um, actually a book. It's actually a book. And it's actually a novel and it's actually a story. Um, yeah. Um, I, I, I was thinking about writing a book myself. Um, or not, I wasn't thinking about it. There's been several people in my life that go, dude, you have to write a book about that. Because uh, my life has been quite um, odd and strange in a lot of ways. Mm. And um, I've, I've been on a lot of adventures. Mm. And uh, yeah, they're like, man, you got to write a book about that. People would fucking love that. Mm. You, know? Um, uh, you know, from Afghanistan to university to, you know, here. Mm. Uh, all, all the stories that I know and the people that I know and the, and the places I've seen. Like, I have a Forrest Gump complex. I used to have a Lieutenant Dan complex, but now I think I've got a Forrest Gump complex. <laughs> Lieutenant Dan! <laughs> Ice cream! <laughs> well, I do like to jog. I have a beard and long hair. Mm. Um, I do like Fleetwood Mac. And um, I've met the Prime Minister a couple of times for different reasons. Oh, wow. Okay. You know, why, are we, um, why are we interviewing me? <laughs> <laughs> Man, I've interviewed a lot of people now in my life. Mm. Like, um, I've done, I was talking about this with you off air before. This is episode 81 of the Pagey Train. Mm. But I've in, I would have interviewed about 500 people by now. Easy. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, like um, music interviews, car racing interviews, uh, politicians. Um, yeah, basically anyone that's promoting something, um, I, I'm always talking to them. Always have been for the last 10 years. Mm. Um, working in TV, um, being a cameraman you're gonna, or in a producer, you just do that. Mm. This is something you do. We should write, you should write, definitely write something. Sounds very interesting. Yeah, uh, man. It's very cathartic as well. Mm. Very cathartic and enjoyable and relaxing. Um, yeah, that's the other thing. I, I, I get that out of script writing and music and writing lyrics for music. Mm. I get the same buzz out of it, but... I've got a few other things on the boil before I can start tackling a book. Like mm. that sounds like a lot of time. It is. You you do have to um, invest a lot of time into it. Um, but I know I, for the most part, enjoyed all of it. Like I, you know, no regrets about how many hours I put into it. You know, it's just to have that finished product there, and mm. it's just just the whole process itself. I just enjoyed doing it. You know, at the end of the day, so that's well, what's the, that's what's the important thing. Well, at three hundred and fifty odd pages. Mm. Um, with a proper font size. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so if you did like a, a like, how, how many pages would you do on average a week? Would you do a couple of pages, oh, one page? It, it, it really vary. Mm. Um, like some weeks I could do 10, 20, 30 pages. Wow. Other, other weeks, none. Yeah. It, it, it just, it really just, I didn't have a consistent schedule. It just really bounced all over the place. Mm, just, okay. You know, just depending on, what my work schedule was like, what how my life was going, um, how hungover you were, <laughs> how hungover I was, um, <laughs> like the mood I was in, um, you know, it just it just really varied. Yeah, okay. Because um, if you're doing like um, what ten pages a week at three hundred and fifty pages, that's a couple of years. Oh yeah, that's a couple of years, and that's without the edit. Yeah, that's before you've edited it. Yeah. So it's yeah, it's a couple of year journey, right? Like for you, it's what seven was well, seven years. Seven year journey. Yeah, eight year journey? so I started. I think it was twenty thirteen. I started it, and oh yeah, yeah so eight, so 20, eight year, eight year yeah. journey. Yeah, so a, but if you take off like those two three years, I wasn't doing anything with it. And then, yeah, but it's still then, in your head. You're still rolling it round because mm. that's probably what brought you back to it. Mm. Like there's part of you that's gone. I have to write this fucking book, mm. man. I'm I like, I'm, I'm this far. I may as well just <laughs> yeah. finish it off and. <laughs> See how we go. So yeah, yeah. No, but you've got the first one out, man. Um, uh, that's the hardest one, right? Mm, uh, they, that's uh, it. Uh, they're doing the first book, they all say it's the hardest one to do because you don't know what you're doing. You, mm. you, you're learning. You're teaching yourself how to write a book because mm. the way that you write a book and the way I write a book are probably totally different, as mm. we've already already learned. Mm. Um, you know, you're a blinking cursor guy. I'm a um, map it out and have a look at it mm. kind of guy. I need to write down all these events that I'm going to talk about. Mm. You know. Um, so you need to teach yourself how to do it. So you're learning as you're doing it. You're learning about yourself and then you've got to get this story out. Um, and I think uh, that's, that's the other thing, commonality I was looking at, you know, so filmmaking and, and, and authorship, they're very similar. Um, you know, because we all have this desire to be storytellers. Everyone I talk to is a storyteller. Mm. Um, whether they're telling it through music or telling it through poetry, telling it through, through novels, telling it through film, they're all telling a story. Mm. And I think it's important. It's important to tell stories because we learn from them. Mm. We get insight to, mm. to how people think and how they act. Mm. 
and what could be. We become dreamers. That's the big part I like about writing. We all become dreamers. Um, so now that you've got this book out there, um, have you got an idea for another book? Oh, I've, I've already started another one. Um, <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> well, I've, I did another interview where they asked me if I was doing a sequel for this book, but I'm not because I'm not a big fan of sequels. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's an entirely different story. Um, it's also a thriller, but it's not set in the outback. It's set in sort of like a suburban or city type area. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's more, I guess, female focused because this book's very blokey. It's mm-hmm. very blokey. It's almost entirely a male cast. Yeah. There's, there's a couple of female characters, but it's mo- almost entirely a male cast. And now I've just kind of done a switch and this next one I'm writing is almost entirely a female cast and it's mm-hmm. more sort of centred around, you know, issues relating to women mm-hmm. and it's a, you know, female protagonist. Um, but I like, I, she's kind of in the, like that grey zone. I, I like writing characters in sort of that grey because a lot of characters that are black and white, they're like, oh, they're a bit boring, but mm. I like I love the characters that you write that are in that sort of grey zone. And I'm also writing um God, I'm writing I'm I'm developing a feature script mm. of a mate of mine that's based on a short film I did a couple of years ago. And then I've got a sort of two other scripts that are in development as well. Okay, wow. So, <laughs> there's there's a, lot, a lot going on yeah, too. There's, there's a lot going on. <laughs> yeah, no, but that's good it's good to have a lot going on. It really is. Um, you've got to keep busy and you've got to keep your brain active. You've got to, because your brain's a muscle. If you don't mm. use it, man, it's just going to waste away. Mm. Um, especially when you're young, man, if you're getting those creative juices going, you're really setting the foundations on how you'll be a writer into your 30s and 40s and 50s. Because mm. if you're writing when you're a teenager and you've written this book now, chances are you're going to be a writer in 20 years' time. Like, there's no, yeah. It's not going to get, you're not getting away from yourself. Yeah. There's no escape. Um, this is it. This is it, man. I'm, I'm locked in now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I learned that it, it's one lesson that it took me a long time to learn. Like, I'm a storyteller. There's no, ex- I cannot escape myself. Yeah. It doesn't matter how far I run. It doesn't matter where I hide. You can't hide from yourself. You can't run mm. from yourself. You have to, you, at some point, you have to accept um, what you are and why you're doing it. And um, I accept that I'm a storyteller. I accept that I, I'm happy to use different mediums to do that. It doesn't have to be the same medium. Like yeah. I, can do, I, I, I know, I'm, uh, I, I find that exciting. You know, I find the body experience of writing exciting. Mm. Um, even just, um, like, I, I've had moments of writing where I literally feel it in my hands. I feel the words mm. leaving me. It's a strange sensation. Oh, yeah. Usually it's three in the morning um, after a whole bunch of beer and cigarettes. And, you know, I'm just, shit, man, it's three in the morning. I've got to go to work. Yeah. <laughs> I'm loving this story. Yeah, you love it. You I can really get into it. So, yeah. Yeah, look, I've only, look, I've, I've only ever produced, like, 20... Uh, maybe 15, 20 short films. Um, I've been working on two feature length scripts and um, out of the short film scripts I've written, I would have written about maybe 30, 40. Wow, jeez. And I haven't produced any of them. Wow. Yeah, I just write them. Um, no, they, they, no one's ever read them, some of them. Some people have read them. The ones I want to produce, people have read. The one I want to produce this year is called Microcosm, which is a sci-fi uh, so I either write sci-fi or I write gangster films. That's that's that's, that. that's yeah. I'm I'm kind of in that. I love sci-fi, sci-fi horror, mm. or crime thriller. That's my that's your that's your market, your niche. Yeah, yeah. yeah and I love I like um uh yeah, yeah sci-fi and I like yeah realistic you know, or black comedy um, yeah. gangster films, gangster stories. I love writing those. Um, I love writing bad guys. I'm really good at writing a bad guy. Oh, they're, they're awesome to write. Yeah. I, I love writing them. Yeah, I love the dialogue of a bad guy. I'm really good at it. Mm. Um, I love writing threats when they're going to be menacing. I love mm. that part of it. Mm. But it's, it's, it's strange that you, you brought up about some um, uh, writing, a, uh, uh, writing female characters. Yeah. And I had the same challenge. It was about five, six years ago, I started writing female characters because I realized that all of my stories were male-centric. Mm. So I'm like, oh well, this doesn't really represent the world, and how can one, how can everyone relate to your story if it's just a whole bunch of dudes in it all the time? You know, mm. sometimes some stories require that. Mm. Um, like you know, Stand by Me is a story about five boys that are looking for a dead body, you know, um, uh, near a train track, right? That that suited to that story. Yeah. But um, after a contrast of many many scripts that you would write, you're gonna have to write a female character at some point. Yeah. And then I started doing it and. I got a few um, ladies to read my work and they're like, this isn't representative of 
what women think like, dude. Yeah. So I had to really think about it. Mm. So I found that a challenge the first few times writing a female character. Because all of my characters that I've been developing since I was a child um, uh, uh, are either superhero in nature. Yeah. And they're all these masculine yeah. characters. Mm. Um, and when you look at that, that you've got to go, well, there's not a lot of depth to that. Like mm. th- th- It has its place, but if it's totally centralized around that, and then it becomes shallow really quickly. Mm. You lose contrast. So yeah, that's that's the that's my new exploration is finding characters that are, are challenging to write. Mm. That's that's what I've been enjoying as well. Mm. Um, yeah, definitely, man, definitely. Um, so yeah, you got your stories coming up. Where can we find Abandoned? Let's get into that. Where can we find this book? So it's uh, on Amazon. So Amazon, uh, Book Depository, uh, Dimix. Barnes and Noble, which only Americans will probably use. Um, I have like six percent of my audience are American. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I got a shout out to the guys in California, <laughs> my other fellow podcasters. I love it how we're ripping each other off. It's great. <laughs> um, uh, Angus and Robinson. Uh, I, pretty much, I'd say ninety percent of books. Like I've, you know, I've, I've found it in on you know websites in you know, I don't, I don't know what the language is, but just foreign websites like, yeah, foreign, like foreign bookstores and stuff like that and and it's on my website as well i should probably put that in that's probably yeah yeah important. what's your website so, dude uh jesse jesse highland media.com so, okay. you can, so you can purchase it on my website as well um but uh yeah those are the main places you can get it from yeah it's 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 because you've just you've just sparked some thoughts into me especially about um looking at publishers right because a publisher is essentially an aggregate Mm. they're a pool of information they're a pool of content and then they disseminate that out to different networks um even doing the pagey train like i've got an aggregate site that i put the uh, a publisher that i go to and that's anchor and then they figure out where they can put your podcast Mm. and then as your podcast gets more popular you end up in more places Mm. um i don't think there's anywhere i'm not wow okay i'm everywhere that's pretty impressive yeah yeah the coolest one i'm happy with is iHeartRadio. Big shout out to my iHeartRadio listeners out there. Yeah, I, I do a um, bit of iHeartRadio with Sky News. Yeah. Uh, well, that's really good because if... Well, you can't... Um, to get on Sky... Uh, sorry, to get on iHeartRadio, you can't just buy your way in. Because yeah. most publishers or aggregate sites, you can buy your way in. like, uh, and, or, or you just publish. Like YouTube, it doesn't cost you anything. You can just publish there. Like, you can just set up a channel and publish. Mm. But it, um, things like YouTube, they don't act as an aggregate. That's the end. That's the end product. That is the publishing point. Um, but with other sites, especially for um, long form content, um, you need like what they call an RSS. So you put the RSS out and you put it into your aggregate site for mm. me, which is Anchor, and then we'll go out to Overcast, Apple iTunes, mm. Spotify, because mm. um, like, and then they give you all the analytics. That's how I come. I know that six mm. percent of my listenership is in the states. Mm. Well, I used to. I used to do. Um what happened to now because I've left Sky I've just left Sky but um, I used to do a lot of the podcasts for Sky putting this podcast for Sky out and I used to use Acast but now they're using Omni Omni yeah and it's great you just put it on there and it just goes everywhere mm. so yeah so that's yeah aggregated sites man and mm. yeah, no, Omni costs money you gotta pay mm. to be on it um, but um, Anchor is free but they will sell advertising space on your behalf and you won't collect any of that revenue mm. but you can if you want you can um, I'm, I'm actually looking, I've got two sponsors on, on the hook at the moment and I don't know if I want to get into them, um, but I'm thinking about doing it. One of them is pretty funny. Do it. Yeah. One of them is pretty it. funny. Um, it's, um, yeah, I, I, I don't want to, I won't say, I won't say, yeah. I won't, I won't do free, free press from just yet, <laughs> but, um, yeah, I should, there's one of them that I go, that's fucking a hilarious sponsor. I just, even, I don't want to, do, I just, it's not about the money. It's just about the hilarious sponsor that it'll be. Because they're not going to do the ad. Because yeah. a part of their contract is they're going to have to do an ad for them. Mm. But uh, is there a number of ads you got to do for them? Or no, I think out of uh, I just got to do. Uh, yeah, no, there is. I got to do two ads per episode for them. For one um, sponsor. One sponsor, per, yeah. Per okay. So I just do two ads, and all I got to do is talk about their product mm. and do a review on it. Mm. Um, which is, it's. Uh, I'll tell you off air later. It's, okay. it's fucking hilarious. Uh, <laughs> and, I, and I put it, it's funny with you. You put things out to the universe, right? Because when you put things out to the universe, they generally show up. Like, um, I, I needed, like, for instance, um, I was saying to um, uh, dudes in uh, you know, a production with me, I go, oh, man, we just need a, a small contract. for $2,000. We just need a $2,000 contract. 
and it puts us into a better tax advantage situation and things become more rosy for us. So we just we, All we need is one more client this year. Mm. And three days later, phone rings going, hey, can you come do this live streaming event for us? We're like, yes, we get to earn. Um, so I, I'm a big believer in you put it out to the universe and it'll show up in mm. some way or another. Maybe not what you desired or hoped, but it'll show up in some way. In some form. In some form. Yeah. And... Um, yeah, I just, yeah, I, I think, um, well, with iHeartRadio, right, I, I, you can't buy your way into it and you've got to apply. You've got to apply and they can reject you. They go, no, you don't have enough viewership. Uh, or they can go, no, uh, your content isn't uh, great or you're not technically proficient. There's a whole bunch of reasons why. Mm. And three weeks, they didn't reply to me. I'm like, oh, man, I got rejected from iHeartRadio. Fuck, fuck. And then I got the email. And they're like, you're now on iHeartRadio. And I mm. looked into the rules of that. And that makes me an official broadcaster. Mm. That's so cool. It's, it That's is, awesome. isn't it? I was yeah. so stoked with myself, mm. man. Because like, it was a lot of hard work to get to that point. Like, mm. I was already on air. I'm um, doing, or well, not on air, but on the internet. Um, doing this for two years at that point. Mm. And you've got a lot of content behind you. And then you realize it's a bit of a pat on the back. Mm. Well, the hard work pays off. At it the does. End of the day, so, yeah. It does, it does. It really does. Um, uh, put put things out in the universe and you'll get it, but don't think that it's a give me. Mm. You've got, you got to go and get it. Mm. You've got to get after it. Uh, especially writing a book, man, you've got to get after it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but what was the relief like when you finished the book? Like, when you, well, like where, where was the point where you've gone, I've, I've done this? When, when, where was that point? Probably when the book came out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because, like, even, like, there was, like, I was, there was, like, little, like, you get so specific with the changes. You're like, oh, it's not perfect. It's not perfect. Or you get so that, yeah. and most people wouldn't even, you know, probably same with the film when you're mm. editing something. It's just little, it's never done details. You just want to like tweak a little bit and you just keep having like, oh, should I do this? Should I not do this? And then like, even up until like a few weeks until it was published, I was just like very slowly tweaking a few mm -hmm. things here and there. Um, but when I, when it's actually like, you know, sent through and they've said to me, this is when it's coming out. It's like, okay, well, that's it. Um, finally, it's done. It's done. And it's just like... But it's like, it, it is like that in film. Like, it's never done. You can constantly edit a film. Mm -hmm. and, and at some point, you've got to go, I've got to release this content. Yeah. I've just got to release it. Yeah. Um, it's never done, but it's done enough. Uh, and then um, then you go through the death of the author. You know, um, I think it was... Can you, can you find that out for me, Mr. Wade? Can you type death of the author, question mark? I think it's Descartes that said it. I'm not sure. Misty's probably listening to this later. Um, going, no, it's not fucking Descartes. Death of the author. Anyway, who is who said it? Death of the author, 20th century. Hold. Who? Come on. Oh, there it is. Where was it? The death of the author, French. Uh, Le Mans d'Etier. Am I saying Say that it? five times fast. Yeah, Le Monde Dutier. Oh, man, I'm sure. No, so it wasn't Descartes. It was Le... Uh, um, uh, can you go back go back up for me, Mr. Wade, and type in... Um, uh, 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 who said that? Who who, uh, who said it? Death of the author, who said that? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. This is going to bug me. It's going to bug me. Bath! That's who it was. Roland Barth. Yeah. So death of the author. The concept of death of the author is that you may have an intention for this book. You've got a subtext. You've got a context. But when I read it, I might not have any of that in my head when I read it. I have a yeah. totally different interpretation, interpretation of it. Yeah. Um, so um, there used to be this idea that when painters would paint, they'd go, I've got this idea. I'm trying to get this message across and that message was rarely conveyed mm. because everyone looks at it because they take their own life experiences and attach them to the story or attach mm. them to the painting mm. and they find different meaning in it so when you publish and release something you suffer a death it's no longer yours anymore this yeah, book it's, is it's, no, the, it's the public's now it belongs much, to so. them yeah it's not your book anymore mm. you wrote it mm. but it's not, the story has now left you mm. it's finally gone mm. And um, yeah, that's that's what they refer to as the death of the author. Mm. You, you 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 can't change it now. Mm. It's 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 set in stone, and whatever people read of it, they will make their own interpretation of it. That's it. Doesn't that's matter what it. you think. Same with film. <laughs> yeah, man. So that's done. That's it. It's sent off, and however people interpret it or view it, you know, you got your own way of how you you know 
constructed it and mm. put it all together and you know linked things together but at the end of the day mm. however someone interprets it, it's the way they're going to interpret it so mm. i did an experiment in this so i did a sci-fi called kernel you can check it out on my uh, uh youtube channel um so i wrote i wrote a whole bunch of scenes and i hadn't made anyone talk in the sci-fi i knew what the premise was I'll give the premise away straight away. Um, but um, there was uh, these guys that live in this matrix and they don't live, know that they live in the matrix. And there's these three dudes, but they're all the same dude. But they don't know that they don't look they don't look alike. They have different avatars, but they're the same person. They're just a copy of each other. Mm. And um, one of them murders himself and then he goes and buries himself. But then the avatar illusion slips away and he realizes that he is himself. Right? And that's the story. Like, I'd already written that as the story, but I hadn't made any of the characters talk yet. Mm. But when I made them talk, I just I made it nonsensical but making sense. So I used a whole bunch of sci-fi jargon mm. that had no meaning at all. Like, no meaning. Mm. And when you watch it, people would go to me, man, that was, that was really deep movie and the way that he talked about this and talked about that. And in my mind, I'm like, I deliberately... <laughs> had <laughs> no purpose but that that was the search people have for, like they search for meaning they search for meaning you, you originally had no, no intention of putting meaning in it yeah, yeah. i deliberately didn't yeah. have an intent yeah and just an experiment to wow. see what would that's, happen that's crazy so i did that as an experiment to see what would happen mm. and when people reflected back to me they really enjoyed the film they're like yeah man it's a really cool premise like they don't get me wrong the part that was deliberate is the fact that they're the same person like the, the plot is deliberate mm. but the dialogue is not in a it is nowhere near tied mm. to anything mm. it's totally random it reminds me of that thing from um that's i remember it was like a joke they said about in um english class in high school where the english teacher would be like that the blue scarf he's using is representing his depression or sadness mm. and the author's like no it's just a fucking it's just a scarf blue scarf <laughs> <laughs> well they, well they say in storytelling this everything is is deliberate yeah that's what they say and, and when i got heard that line i thought oh, i'm gonna make it undeliberate yeah. or not deliberate deliberately so I was gonna, I, there's a double negative in there i know but I, I i i sought to do that i sought to make it sensical but nonsensical with no meaning mm. and then people attributed all this meaning to it and i was mm. like astounded i'm like wow mm. this definitely author shit is real mm. really is um yeah you should guys should go check it it's one of my first films i think it was like the second film i ever made it was, mm. it was, it was a student film I uh, made at WSU. You would recognise a lot of locations in it, actually. Actually, yeah. can you, go pull it up, Mr. Wade. Let's go find it. <laughs> I'm going to pull up this movie. Um, see if you can recognise any of these spaces. Um, now, if you go to channels, go to my channels there. Oh, actually, no, go to uh, home. Go to home. Let's go right down to the bottom. Uh, here we go. And, and then arrow right on that bottom line there. Where is it? It's called Colonel. Are these all your shorts? Yeah, yeah, there we go. So hop into that one. Uh, the one that says Colonel Part 1. You were on it. You were just on it. One more right. One more right. One more right. There we go. Yeah, so this is Colonel. Um, this is totally made on university property. The whole thing. So I probably recognise a lot of this. Yeah, man, you will. Like, this is a... Um, yeah, especially that scene there. Here we go. If it ever catches up. Come on in, isn't it? There we go. That's uh, WSU. My first track shot. <laughs> this is at the back, actually, at the back of um, Kingswood campus. Oh, okay. Yeah. I was mostly at Wearington South, ninety-five percent of the time. Yeah, there's some Wearington South in here. Uh, when did you make this? This was made in two thousand and twelve, I think. Oh, okay. Just forward in a little bit more, Wayne. Forward in a little bit more. Just grab, grab the. Uh, Keep going, keep going, until you get to the buildings. No, not that one. That's near there. There, yeah, that one. Yeah, you recognise this part. There you go. That's oh, that. yeah. That's, yeah. That, yeah. That, yeah. That's, <laughs> that's building BJ. Yep. <laughs> Remember that. <laughs> yeah, I even did all the foley for this. But, um, yeah, so it's all about... It's one of those movies, what's in the case? Mm. You know, no one knows what's in the case. But these are all the same dude, and they've got all this... Like, not, like all this... Um, uh, all this jargon, all this sci-fi jargon that actually doesn't have any meaning. Mm. And the people thought it was really deep and crazy moving. I love that you did that. Yeah, man. That's I was, so cool. Yeah. Well, <laughs> well, it all came about by accident. Oh, vertigo shot. I love that. <laughs> that was so hard. That took 17 takes. Yeah, thanks for that, Wayne. Yeah, um, 
yeah, uh, yeah, we, we, yeah, that was a lot of fun. Um, uh, that was, yeah, that was like the 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 second film I ever shot yeah. or directed, I think. Dire- the first, the second film I ever directed and wrote. Yeah, but it was really cool. Like I was, I'm getting paid jobs after that, which was cool. Mm. Yeah, because as soon as you start working, you're working. Mm. You know? Um. Yeah, what what was it like? So, you, when did you fin- you would have finished uni at the round about the same time as me? I think. Yeah, my last year was twenty fifteen. Twenty fifteen, a couple yeah. years after me. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I think I finished twenty thirteen because you were still at TVS, weren't you? Or, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't even remember. We did. I did the. Um, I was involved in that tomorrow tonight show. Do you remember that? Tomorrow or? tonight. Yeah. I got. I got some. Inter- you were on that. I remember. Yeah, I, now. I was on that show. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's right. <laughs> Um, yeah, shot in the old TV, on the SD's TV studio. Um, <laughs> I've got some interesting information about Tomorrow Tonight for I you. I do. Yeah, because TVS shut down, mm. right? And that was the last show mm. that played on TVS. I know that, yeah. Yeah. Because um, I, I, I had um, uh, some of the promos from Made in the West, because I got to write the schedule at the end. Mm. Right? I had full control of everything at the end. Mm. And I thought, I'm just going to put all of my friends' content on. Like anything that any of my friends were a part of, mm. I just put their content on in the last hour of TBS. Mm. Like I didn't do anyone else's stuff. Like. I think I remember you saying that on a, another episode or something like that. Something to do with TBS. You put all the yeah content or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Know. I put yeah. all all of our promos. I, I tried to source everything I could to to really squeeze that last moment of TV glory in there. Mm. And uh, yeah, and we did. We did, man. Um, big shout out to Tom Lahure, actually. Yeah, Tom Lahure. I haven't seen him in. In years. Yeah, man. He's still working out there at Viacom, I think. Yeah. Um, uh, which is really cool because I got him working at TVS for a while there as a ingest operator. And yeah, he did a, he did a hosting for me. I'm trying to get you back, bro. Come do a hosting for me if you're listening. <laughs> I've, got some main, I've got some Main the West stuff for you. You'd be perfect. Um, yeah, no, he's a really, really funny guy. Um, I loved his um, uh, Seinfeld impersonations. That was yes. pretty good. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, um, but so 2015, man. So yeah, um, uh, so you went straight out of the gate, straight into Sky News, or no, 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 no. So um, I actually um, was doing a lot of um, casual work for a while, casual writing. Jobs. Actually, I it was a bit of a challenge at the start because I, I kind of fell a bit out of love with journalism when I left, mm-hmm. um, and I was like, uh, and I just I kind of was I was actually working at JV Hi-Fi for a bit, and I was doing sort of like a lot of freelance work and casual work doing writing and media jobs Mm -hmm. and then i went sort of into marketing and content and social media Mm -hmm. and doing a lot of that sort of stuff and then social media posting yep yeah all that sort of the joy Mm. (laughs) and then uh big shout out to my uh, team love you jay love you misty and then uh (laughs) i i was just doing um yeah different marketing and writing jobs and then and then sort of the wiggles gig came around and and i had i was actually i I was doing my own business at the time as well doing Mm. content for businesses doing the website social media email campaigns all that sort of thing and then then i started working at wiggles and then i was working full-time at sky and then sort of quit the business Mm. because i didn't have time for it and and yeah and then i was at sky for a couple of years and now i'm now off to the daily mail yeah Yeah, great man that's a great that's a good journey man it's a good trajectory uh, but it, it, you, you got to look at it though. I guess the point I'm getting to is like by running your, your business of trying to um, you know do campaigns for small businesses, mm. doing web design, writing copy for that web mm. uh, design as well. You should because they'll probably give you like some content. But generally, when you're doing those kind of jobs, you write all the content. Pretty much, yeah. They'll, they'll give you bullet points, but you write, you make it grammatically correct and do it properly. Because mm. most um, small businesses, if you're doing like you know some lawn mowing business and they're setting up their website, like they're not really articulating what their business is in the way that you would in a marketing sense. Mm. That's a different voice that mm. they wouldn't be attuned to. So you generally have to write all the copy and then you're doing a social media campaign, you're writing all the copy. Um, I'm a big fan of templates. Once you build something, you shouldn't have to build it again. Websites especially. I've got a, When I was doing web design for people, I have a few templates that I'd built so I don't have to redo it. Mm. Um, I'm really glad that I don't have to do HTML coding anymore. Oh, God. Fuck! <laughs> I can do it. It's it is it is cool. It's kind of like C prompt, right? It's kind of like command prompt in that way, where you know, um, we you're in a DOS program where you're literally coding. Yeah, it's literally coding. You know, close bracket, open bracket. Oh, God, mm. I don't know. I'm, I'm having a I'm, I'm being triggered. 
<laughs> been having, having flashbacks. Flashbacks of coding <laughs> at two in the morning. No, uh, with, with all these other ones that are out there now, um, Wix and uh, Squarespace, all these guys. Oh, it makes it so much easier. Way easier. Yeah. Way easier. And more intuitive as well. Like, um, I've started looking at campaigns that you can do through um, web design now. So they've really started to integrate campaigns into the web platform. Because mm. before they're quite separate, you'd have to come up with a campaign and then integrate it yourself. Mm. Now you don't have to do that; it's already integrated. And it'll actually it'll do like um like Mailchimp for you, right? So you know how you do Mailchimp, and you send out to everyone. Yeah. Well, there's internet um, companies. Oh, sorry, website web design companies have cottoned onto that. They're going, oh, well, don't go use Mailchimp. They're too expensive anyway. Um, we do this on our platform, go premium, and then you can do everything at a one-stop shop. Mm. So I'm starting to look into that. Well, I'm not. My team is looking into it. Um, but I, I, I was looking into different marketing through Adobe as well. Like they got some Adobe campaign is really interesting because mm. they, they will do that will do all your social media posting, and it will do all of your emailing. Oh wow! And, and customize too. Wow! So, so it just incorporates all of it into one. Just yeah, incorporates the whole campaign. Yeah. That's that's where we're going now with all the technology. It's, it's just, amazing, just dude. Click at the button, then you're off. Man, I was looking at a, um, I was looking at a, a tutorial on Adobe campaign. And they just do like a big um, uh, pyramid. So this is your campaign. It's got to go to this site. So it will populate your website for you. Mm. It will populate your social media platform. So you'll do you'll do your Instagram, Facebook. Uh, now even does TikTok. You know, now, you, you, you you need to populate it with the content. Yeah, but that's all you do. It is, again, it acts as an aggregate. So you just put it in the aggregate site, and then it will disseminate for you, and it'll put it in the correct formats. Because that was the other problem. And you're looking at mobile devices. Then you're looking at your web devices, and they're mm. totally different because the ratio is different, and it's a pain in the ass, mm. especially when you're back on WordPress. Don't get me wrong, WordPress was good at its at a, in its day, but doing WordPress now, I can't imagine anything worse mm. um, compared to to Wix or um, uh, Squarespace. Well, I just use Squarespace, and it's just so easy. Everything's just yeah, it's so drop easy. and drag. Yeah, it's all drop and drag. Yeah, um, but it's going beyond that even. Like it's, I'm watching it grow into something that I can't see. Like, because you could see where campaign would come from. Mm. Like, you go, if I just had some software that would integrate all of these codes together and just put it in the correct format for me, and all I do is populate the space, and then I'd have to think about it. I can um, uh, post and ghost that shit, you know. Mm. Um, but uh, there's, I now see it going in a direction that I can't see what the future is. Like, I can't imagine it, but I know that it's going to evolve into something. Yeah. And that's where it's really, that's where I, I just find it fascinating, man, watching this shit grow, being the canary in this um, coal mine, um, or maybe it's a gold mine, I don't know. Mm. Um, but yeah, there's the, the stuff that we're doing now, like I look at the um, administrative architecture of Made in the West and look how it's evolved in the last 10 years. And it's been through about, it's up to its fifth evolution. Mm. So yeah. start off as basic email, basic posting, basic YouTube. But now it's, it's oh man, it's got um, you know, in some arenas, it's got a hundred thousand reach, man. Yeah, you know, and it needs better tools to manage that market. Yeah, which is insane. Yeah. It's insane, dude. Yeah. Like um, even when we hit uh, five thousand, that was hard. Mm. When you got five thousand people in your mailing list, that's really hard, man. It's really difficult to manage. Mm. And then our databases, we're even starting to run out of disk space on this shit. For God's sake, I'm like when you when your Excel is starting to fill up your your hard drive, you know, you've got a lot of data. Yeah, got a lot of content there. <laughs> a, lot of con- a lot of content. So, yeah, and then it comes into a data management systems as well. Um, libraries, that's the other thing I've been running. So, run libraries so we don't have to keep rebuilding things. So, I'm a big fan of templates, man. Mm. Build the templates. Once they're built, they're built. you just got to repopulate them. And I imagine it would be the same for campaign. Once you've built your campaign, you could, you could then extrapolate that architecture to any business. Yeah. You know? It's not that hard, but I, I don't know. How do you feel about social media, man? Are you, are, are you on Facebook? Are you on Instagram? Uh, I'm on Facebook. I'm on Instagram. Um, I, I have Twitter, but I don't. I don't really use Twitter. Mm. Um, even though you know, I, I don't if, tweet. Even though I'm in like journalism, I should be using Twitter, but I don't use it that much. It's a toxic but, echo chamber. <laughs> well, yeah, I see a lot of I see a lot of crap on. Twitter, but um, I'm the one I mostly use is Instagram. I use Instagram a, quite a lot. Mm. Um, Facebook, on and off. I did a post about um, the book, which is like the first post I'd done in like months. Mm. Because I just I just don't post on Facebook. 
I don't yeah. know. Yeah. I, I'm using Facebook in a strange way these days. I actually use it as an aggregate. Back on this aggregate thing, man, I use it to post on Instagram. So if I post on Facebook, it will post on my Instagram for me. Oh, okay. So both at the same time. Yeah, yeah. man. Yeah. Through publishing tools. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It went through a lot of um, uh, teething issues. Um, I don't know if you've used publishing tools before, but um, uh, for all of you um, uh, people out there trying to be promoters, you will know what I'm talking about. Um, yeah, publishing tools is the back end of Facebook. So when you're running several several sites or several pages, it will give you publishing tools. Mm. Well, you probably already have... If you have one page, you would have publishing tools. Yeah. And out of that, you can then select to go uh, to Instagram. You can click a button and go, this post also goes to my Instagram account. Mm. And then you can link your Instagram accounts. The problem I run into is I have so many pages. I've got five Facebook pages and two Instagram accounts. So link, oh, wow. linking that together and making what post is appropriate becomes yes. a challenge. Um, so that's why I try to aggregate it and use Facebook as the main platform. Yeah. In other ways, I do use Instagram for the same purpose because you can use Instagram the other way. What I'm just trying to get into now is Instagram TV. I'm trying to work out how to use it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so it's a bit of a challenge. It's just another thing I have to fucking learn. Yeah. I'm, um, I'm just fine with posting in stories. Yeah, yeah. I'm just fine doing that. <laughs> <laughs> stories does well, man. Stories does really well. Well, that's the thing I like about Instagram, though. It's shallow. It, yeah. There's no, there's no one's getting angry in there. Yeah. Like, you don't see hate mail in there or, no. or shit posting in there. No. You go to Facebook, you'll see a whole bunch of shit posting if you look hard enough. And the problem with that algorithm is, if you start looking at shit posting, more of it will show up. Yeah. So then you go, then you have to be disciplined with what content you read because then you go, I don't want more of this shit to show up. Yeah. Same, um, same with Twitter. Yeah. There's a lot of Twitters like that as well. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, yeah, I don't know. There's a lot of, but the other one I'm interested in now is also um, private spaces on 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 the internet. You know, um, you look at Messenger, for instance. It's more private, the private groups that are in there. Um, um, yeah, and there's one that I've been looking at is Signal. So Signal is like totally encrypted message service, mm. and it will that sounds familiar. Yeah, it deletes. So when you post in there, it will delete it afterwards. It's kind of like a Snapchat sort of thing, but encrypted. Um, because then you look at Snapchat. I'll try to figure out how Snapchat monetizes. And you go, it must be pretty sinister shit that they're doing to sell, to make that free. Mm. Like, you got to understand. Because if it's free, you're the product, mm. right? And you go, how am I a product in Snapchat? Yeah. What analytics could you possibly be getting out of that? I don't tick like on anything. That means you're listening to me. And you're watching my photographs, and you're looking, and you're looking at my life, and you're making, and you're giving me a rating and a statistic. Yeah. Um, do people? Know. Do a lot of people still use Snapchat? I kind of feel like that Snapchat peaked. Yeah. Years ago. I think um, I, I, but it, it's used in a private sense. Yeah. There's two ways I see Snapchat being used in my life, and that is through um, uh, family chat lines. Oh yeah. yeah. So family groups. And uh, the other ones is, uh, what I've learned is, um, um, you know, because when you go and score weed, you do it the old fashioned way. You go to a pub, you meet someone that's a bit shady. <laughs> then you've got to go to their fucking house, act like your friends. <laughs> um, no, uh, actually. Um, you, you don't have a mate on dial? No, no. If, if, if my weed dealer's out there listening, uh, I, I don't mean you. I don't mean you. We're friends. But um, no, but you know what I mean. It's, yeah, it's a fucking yeah. hassle, right? Yeah. And it's a risky hassle as well. You don't know what you're fucking walking into sometimes. But what I've learnt is that the kids these days don't do that. They use Snapchat to mm. score weed. Mm. Um, that's how that's how you meet people. Uh, they believe that I don't know for some reason they go, oh, you can't trace Snapchat. Well, who fucking knows you can trace. <laughs> what the fuck are you talking about, man? <laughs> the whole thing is geo tagged, man. Yeah. It's probably got its camera on, like you know. And you're going in there and you're making illicit deals in Snapchat. Um, but that's what I understand it's used for. Um, so, so a friend told me. That's, uh, that's <laughs> a buddy of mine. A buddy I'm of mine. To, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't want to out them. But uh, apparently that's what, that's what Snapchat's used for. Yeah. Um, and then you've got some... Yeah, these other messaging services. Are, uh, uh, WhatsApp. Yeah, yeah, yeah. WhatsApp's another one that is encrypted apparently. So I do a lot of work group stuff in there. So we use um, WhatsApp as if it was like a sauna... Or um, Workday, I think it's called. Oh, yeah, Workday, yeah. Yeah, it's like um, uh, um, administrative organiser and conversational organiser um, where you could set tasks to people and, you know, you can get... Um, yeah, you can set tasks and deadlines to staff members and that sort of thing. It's a workplace organisation thing. So we use WhatsApp that way. 
Um, I know my team that are listening to this going, you don't fucking read WhatsApp, man. Every time I go in, there's 40 unread messages. <laughs> it's just another fucking platform, dude. I'm there's so like, many of them now, though. So many. So many. So many. And there's not going to be more. It'll just keep fragmenting. Yeah. It'll just become more and more and more. I refuse TikTok. I'm not doing it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just not fucking doing it. Uh, maybe I should. Maybe I should. Uh, look, because they're even saying that I go, yeah, but if you look at the market for Pagey Train, you could probably get more listenership if you do some uh, yeah. TikTok. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck. Um, just yeah. quick video bites. Just Yeah, yeah, just do video bites yeah. while I'm on the show. Yeah. yeah. Buzz, buzz, buzz. Um, but um, yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't know. I, 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 Twitter is my limit. I won't get on the Twitter. Don't do that to yourself. No, I don't want to. <laughs> and, and Facebook is, is kind of in the middle. The way I look at it, though, like Facebook is like, like when I look at it from a band point of view, and when I'm advertising a band, um, uh, back in the old days before the internet, you'd go around to telegraph poles and then put your poster on it. Yeah. On a post. You would post on a post. Right? And then you go, oh, okay, this is starting to make sense. <laughs> I get where they're getting their shit from. To publish and post. And there's a difference between publishing and posting because publishing means that you've written it and posting means that you've taken something else that someone has written and I'm sharing it. Mm. Right? So I understand the, the vernacular that they're using or the words that they've picked up, the, the, the jargon, if you will. So in the old days, it used to be get, your, get an ad in the um, music magazine, get an ad on each telegraph pole and go to the local pub area, stand on a corner, hopefully with someone that's hot, uh, male or female that is handing out flyers for you going make sure you go see this man make mm. sure you go see this man we don't do that anymore that's all digitized and that's mm. what that's what I see Facebook as Facebook is literally a telegraph pole mm. it really is it's mm. just something where we post shit on a telegraph pole mm. and in some there's some telegraph poles in the city that you see that have been over posted on like there's just advertisement after advertisement after advertisement and you're right next to a bus station that has a sliding advertisement and that's what I see Facebook as it's the sliding advertisement telegraph pole. Mm. It's a bus stop. And bus stops are usually unhygienic. Um, usually got gum and like other things stuck to it. Maybe a little bit of broken glass. Actually, so, so it's a pretty good comparison. Yeah, that's that's Facebook, right? Yeah. Um, and I think, um, yeah, Instagram's more like a magazine. Mm. It's a magazine that you buy on a shelf and you it's all picture driven. It's all It's all about images. Uh, it's not really about... Uh, they're, they're, don't get me wrong, there are videos and uh, people that have something to say in there, but it's all quite warm and welcoming. Mm. And that's why you want to read a magazine. You go, oh, what's going on in the world today? Yeah. I don't want to read the newspaper. I don't want to be depressed about war. I want to know what this celebrity is doing or this influencer. Let's go, you know, let's go look at what they're doing today. It's a lot... Of, it's very voyeuristic. Mm. Um, but Twitter, man, that's just, yeah. that's like a... That's like a... What's the word count on Twitter? How many words can you put in a... Uh, I think it's characters? 140. 140 characters? Yeah, it's like 140 character cage fight. Um. <laughs> just some of the crap you see on there when, and with journalists and... Mm. Well, especially... Um, like you, can you talk about Sky a little bit now that you've left there? Can, how, how far can we go into that? Um, how do we have how, to be careful? Uh, how far do you want to go? We can, I'll just, well, let's just go for it. Oh, well, I don't know. Well, if we go if we go too far, you just let me know. Yeah. All right. Now, we will have a safe word. You just say bananas. Yeah. <laughs> and then um, we will stop talking about yeah. it. Um, <laughs> no, <clears throat> oh, excuse me. So, um, uh, because Sky News has a lot of rhetoric around it. Yeah. Um, you know, especially Sky After Dark. Yeah. Um, you know, the Bolt Report, these sort of things. Um, I don't know, because I, I, I was always torn in news. When I was working in news, you you, you do the, the ribbon-cutting event, you know, mm. um, open a new school, politician cuts a ribbon, they say a few words, you report on that, and you're with a reporter, you film them doing that, and then you do their take, you know, their, their cutaways, and then you mm. go to the station and you publish. Yeah. Um, and then you do other stories, you're like, um, I don't know, there's ones, there's interviews that I've done with the Catholic Church where I go, oh, these people. Because they talk off camera in certain ways, you're like, oh, oh man, the dude you're talking about sounds guilty. I'm just saying, <laughs> just saying, like, you know, he's found guilty in front of 12 peers, like, he sounds guilty. Um, but they'll be like, yeah, but we don't know, you can't lift a robe. Um, but <laughs> so I'm just, I guess what I'm wondering, yeah, yeah. how do you find that? How do you deal with those things when you, when you're dealing with morality and news? Um, 
Oh no, I put you to on. Me, a... yeah, you, you, you've put me on a bit of a tough spot. Um, well, I just see it as when I'm doing my job, I just see it as because I, 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 I do sometimes. I, I put, a, I used to. Well, I put up some of those programs mm -hmm. and like I'm. But most of the stuff I did was day news, which is just reporting the news. There was no yeah, yeah. spin or political, you know. Um, but in terms of you know like Andrew Bolt you know alan jones all those mm. characters because he's still on alan jones is still on there isn't he yeah well he he um resigned from 2gb yeah 2gb he resigned from nobody's status just kind. like yeah we'll just reel that in um you know i just you know i don't really agree with all everything they say but mm. it's just whatever it's just i just see it as my job other people have a you know would probably have a moral thing about it depending on where they sit in the political spectrum but mm. like, i've just to me it's just like i'm just I'm just reporting the day I'm the just, daily news yeah because i used to have this thing like um because I, I, I realized something about the news for me because when i got into because um, i was excited um being an associate producer on the news i was excited about that job so cause you go well we get to go and talk to these people we get to interview people we get to you get to do these fun things and doing production as well i was doing like operating the camera go into an edit suite and then edit the content, you know, I was an all-rounder, all-round news producer. Mm. And, um, you know, and go source stories as well. It was like really exciting stuff. Uh, but then after a while, I realized, what am I doing here? I'm not actually, re I'm re like, I'm a part of this reporting team that's reporting. But then you go, well, well but the product is an, ends up on TV. Yeah. And there's eyes watching the TV in order for them to watch advertisements. That's that's the that's the model. That's mm. the business model. Like we want them watching advertisements, or we want them subscribing, paying for it. Mm. That that's it, it, either way. There's a, there's a there's a pay point in there somewhere, and and then I realised like what is news? I don't know I started coming up with the opinion of news is entertainment. Mm. Um, you, you, if news isn't entertaining, people won't watch it. Mm. And I see these days, you know, um, uh, especially because I'm a big Media Watch fan. I love watching yeah, Media I love, Watch. I love Media Watch as well. Yeah. And, I, and, the, and, the, and the thing about Media Watch is I just love the mudslinging between Media Watch and Sky News that I just see every week. That's it's kind of hilarious. what I was getting. That's kind of what yeah. I was getting to. Because like, in some point you go, because I can see the points of Media Watch and they go, um, you know, uh, this 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 was mis misrepresented on the Bolt Report or whatever. Yeah. And then you go, yeah, but he's got eyes on him and he's catering to his market. Mm. That's his market. Mm. And then, but at the same time, they go, well, the irony is, is that they're creating a news show about the news mm. and they're catering to their market. Mm. And the irony is that they're both based on outrage. Mm. Because if you look at um, uh, like a Sky After Dark market, they say some outrageous things mm. to get out outrageous attention. Mm. Yeah. Well, there was, there was times when I've... Um when something has gone to air and then usually I, I, I publish, I don't know if I say this, but fuck it, I'll just say it anyway. <laughs> uh, I, I would, um, something would go to air, the show would play mm. and then I'd have to put it up the next morning on podcasts or whatever it is. Mm. And then sometimes I'll get an email that we're like, oh yeah, can you take this second bit out? And it'll just be something that's a bit, Oh, too far. A bit too far. Yeah, yeah. And they'll just be like, just, yeah, just, just, just cut that out. Just, oh, just dude. a nice clean cut. Oh, dude, I've done, I've done it on the pagey train. I've done it. Um, there's, yeah. been, there's been interviews I've had, I'm like, oh, I'll just snip that bit out. I'll just take that bit out. That went a bit too far. Um, because that happens in, that does happen in production. Because mm. essentially, even looking at my little humble show here, like, um, there's part of it where you go, well, I'm trying to be informative. I'm trying to promote people and get their content out there. Yep. At the same time, we talk about stuff that's interesting. You want to be entertaining. There's, there's, there's two hooks involved in that, you know? Yeah. And, and that's why I look at, when I look at Media Watch, I go, but you're doing exactly the same thing as Sky News, man. Yeah. You're just repackaging it. Yeah. It's repackaged at a different optic. Yeah. That's all you've done. You're making people out, oh, look at this person out there. They're outrageous. And then on, uh, on their show, what they're, what they're probably complaining about is like, look at those people over there. That's outrageous. It's the same model when you really zoom out from it. Mm. And I find that unusual, but... Yeah, I, I don't know. I try to get a good spectrum of the news. So do I. I mean, I don't. I mean, I, you know, I like this part Skylight, parts ABC. I like, I'm not really, I'm not like, you know, someone that just exclusively just focuses on, you know, one news station or one, you know, I like to get a, mm. you know, a, opinions across the political spectrum as political commentators or news mm. or whatever it is. Um, you know, I, I take it all in because I enjoy listening to it and I, you know, yeah, I'm, so. a, I'm a big news junkie. I love the mm. news, man. Um, but as I say, 
Um, I, I then start to look at my... And, and I like making the news. I like um, being in the news. And I like watching the news. Mm. All of those things are cool. Um, actually, I got a bit of a, a, my own shout-out. Shout-out to Roscoe. Because <laughs> um, I, I photographed the, um, uh, the lunar eclipse a couple of days ago. And my photograph ended up on ABC Morning Oh, really? I was like, yeah, the pagey train. Because I hashtagged it, the pagey train. I was like, yeah, man, that's my fucking photo. That's pretty sick. Yeah, well, I shot it on a, um, a iPhone through a telescope. So I rigged it up to a telescope and, and, and did some photography through that. Mm. Astrophotography, if you will. Um, and yeah, no, it ended up on there. So it ended up on the news. So being in the news is cool. Producing the news is cool. Mm. And watching the news is, is, is fun as well. I, I don't know. I'm a... I'm a I'm a political news watcher. I love mm. the political news. Mm. Um, I do enjoy it as well, but then it gets to a point where it's like, okay, is it's getting too much. I need a I need a break from this, like just a temporary break. Yeah, I think I really got when Gillard and when um, Gillard knifed Rudd, and from that point I was in for a long time. Yeah, um, the whole Abbott. Um, phase, I was into that. Yeah. Like, it was just a dog <laughs> fight every day. Like yeah. this is great. Um, I, you know, I used to say to people, you know, I watch, I watch political news like people watch football, yeah. you know, and, um, uh, and I'm not barracking for one team in particular. It's not about that. I just, there, there's you just pe- enjoy watching it. I just enjoy watching it. Yeah. Um, you know, um, like, you know, you could say like, there's, there's, there's two sides to every story. Like, um, you can say what you like about Tony Abbott. He, he's a buffoon. He's a bit of an idiot, but man, he's in the RFS, mm. you know, he does hold on to a hose. Mm. You know, you can say what you, you know, you know what I mean? You, you, you can package it. <laughs> you can package this shit and have yeah. it so much innuendo uh, that you uh, can just... I don't hold a hose. <laughs> I don't hold a hose. But you can... Yeah, but you know what I mean? You can hang... Like, you can use innuendo really easily. Yeah. Really easily. And I yeah. enjoy that. I, I just enjoy how they do it. Yeah. I'm like, I, I love this. Yeah. Um, and at the same time, you try to get that information. Like, I, I want to know what's going on. I want to know yeah. the weather. I think the weather's probably the most valuable thing on the news, but... Yeah. When they're right, they're generally right. Um, uh, getting weather warnings and um, the sport report. You know, I want to know what's happened because I don't have enough time to watch football, so I like to get the sport mm. report. Um, but yeah, so but um, I think we're just about out of time, uh, oh, Jesse. Keep, keep yeah, on. <laughs> yeah, no, we, it goes by very quickly. It goes by very quickly. Um, but um, uh, just one more time. So we got um, abandoned uh, right here uh, from uh, Jesse Highland. Go and check it out on Amazon, uh, Dimix, where Book else? Depository, my website. Yep, uh, website. Um, no, uh, pretty much any book site. Just so that's jessehighlandmedia.com. That's it. Go and check it out. Go and buy the book. Um, you know, it's uh, you know under 30 bucks. Go out there and buy for it. Some places. Some, Some places. places. <laughs> if it's more than 30, don't hold me to it, all right? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, look, um, 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 support authorship, support artists in Western Sydney, and be sure to go out and purchase the book. Um, thank you so much for the copy. No, thank you. I'll, I'll give it a read in the next week. Um let me know and, your thoughts. <laughs> yeah, I'll let you know what I reckon. I'll let you know what I reckon. Um, it's hard to read these days for me, though. I'm not on the train because I drive to work now. Yeah. Being on the train, that was a reading space. Um, and that I've lost that hour, but I've gained that hour. Mm. So, yeah, it's a very unusual. But once again, uh, thank you so much for being on the show. Congre- oh, thank you for having me. And congratulations on your book, Abandoned. Thank you. Thank you very much. No worries. And uh, you've been watching The Pager Train. You can find us on Spotify. You can find us on Apple iTunes. And of course, iHeartRadio. And don't forget, if you guys are watching us, if you're a part of our massive viewership out there, whoever the last subscriber is, thank you very much. Don't forget to subscribe on YouTube. And if you're really enjoying the show, don't forget to hit the notifications. You've been watching The Pager Train, and we'll see you next time. Sonic Boom. Sonic Boom is doing the boom and you are through.